Welcome, welcome, and let's kick this podcast uh, number 12 uh, off right, shall we? Oh, oh, oh. Woo. That's right. Woo-wee. <coughs> if you got children listening, just tell them I'm blowing bubbles. No big deal. Mm. Oh, good God. Okay. Let's start this podcast off right by uh, listening to some royalty-free music again. I thought that was a good bit last week. So this week, I'm on the, the YouTube channel Audio Library. And I'm going to play their top six, is it? One, two, three, four, five, six. Yes, I'm going to play their top six most popular songs. So the first one is called Adventures by A. Hamitsu. Huh, strange. A. Hamitsu. A space H I M I T S U. This is their most popular song. So far, the beginning is. Hmm, let's skip a little ahead here. Yeah, next. Alright, this next one is called We Are One by Vexento. V E X E N T O. Not this one I like. I like the I like the beginning. What do you think, LaFonda? Oh, you nosy bitch, I love you. Ooh. Nice piano. Huh. Well, this one's a definite maybe. Let's uh, go to the next one. High by JPB. JPB? J- like jelly peanut butter? Hell yeah, now I'm hungry. Hmm. A little too bubblegummy for me. Yeah, too poppy already. Sorry, JPB, you got me hungry, but my my, uh, ears are not hungry. (laughs) Stupid. Next one, Good For You by THBD. THBD, what's with all the acronyms here? Eh, A little too slow beginning, let's skip ahead. Meh, negative. All right, let's check this one out. Buddha by Context. Oh, I see. They, the word Context is spelled differently in a hip, cool way. It's with all Ks. Context. It's actually pretty genius how they spelled it. K- K-O-N-T-E-K-S-T. Context. All right, I'll give you a point. Creativity. The song itself, uh, not so much. Actually, I take it back. This would be good exit music. I take it back. What is this garbage? All right, next. Last one. This one's called Last Summer by Ixon. I-K-S-O-N. I'm imagining me as a fat baby playing those fucking Lincoln log drums. Xylophone? Is that what I'm thinking of? Lincoln log? What the fuck? Xylophone. Is I right? Hell yeah, I was right. Xylophone. Is that still a thing? Do people still play xylophones? Does that sound like what this song has playing in it? I would challenge you to find out this song is not nothing but xylophones over a dank beat. Um, eh, kind of a lame drop. Well, we have a winner for this week. It is the song We Are The One by Vexento. V-E-X-E-N-T-O. Yeah, hell yeah. start by first saying, did you see that crazy explosion in Beirut today? I mean, holy hell. When I first saw it, I thought it was like an explosion from a Michael Bay movie or some shit, but 
Oh, man, that was horrifying to see. I mean, it looked like an atom bomb went off, but obviously it's not as big as that. I was being a little dramatic. But it, uh, I, there was a lot of cell phone video from people on the ground or, like, in the surrounding ocean, I think, or a lake, or I don't know what body of water it was. I just saw people on a boat. That video was fucking nuts. Excuse me for cursing so early, but the video was crazy, people. I, if you don't say fuck out loud when you see that video for the first time, something's wrong with you. Now, yeah, if you could see that video, just search Beirut explosion from boat or something. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, it doesn't seem real. So the last I checked, they said that fireworks could be involved, like it was a firework depot or something. But, I mean, that if that was so, I mean, that must have been some fucking Roswell early 51 type fucking fireworks from outer space or some shit because that thing was fucking huge. Also, did you all see that Donald Trump Axios interview? Holy shit. Uh, that poor bastard, Jonathan Swan, all he had to do... Swan? Swan? Is it Swan like the bird? Who am I talking to here? The cat's not going to answer. I think I'm going to... For, for the sake of argument, I'm going to say Jonathan Swan. Swan. Jonathan Swan. Why can I not say the word Swan? Because my brain doesn't want to call a man a bird's name. It's just strange. It's just like I, if someone's last name was Siegel, I would have a hard time saying Siegel. Just like Jason Siegel. Oh, shit. I said that just fine. All right. I don't know what's wrong with me. Uh, Jason Siegel, by the way, is the actor and director. He was in such things as Forgetting Sarah Marshall, Freaks and Geeks, that big show on TV about How I Met Your Mom or some shit. Uh, a, a, a bunch of stuff, people. You know who I'm talking about. Anyway, that interview on Axios was crazy. If you love him or hate him, I think you owe it to yourself to at least watch the president try to give an interview. <laughs> And uh, this uh, reporter, uh, Swan, all he basically did was ask follow-up questions or, like, just ask the president to clarify something he said and actually, like, give evidence. But he does it in a way that's just like, okay, uh, wh where is that on here? Wh where are you getting this information? Uh, can you show me? Um, it, was kind of, it, it was very uh, puzzling to see the president of the United States fold so quickly under pressure just by basic it wasn't even cross-examination. It was just like a follow-up question. Like if I told you, you know, but there was a 13th planet found in our solar system. Isn't that crazy? And then you would say, well, what, where did you get this information? What's the planet's name? What? How come I haven't heard about this? And I just answer by saying, yeah, it's pretty crazy, right? The 13th planet. And I just ignore the questions and just walk away. That's basically what this interview was. And it's crazy to see the president say those things. I feel negative about it. <laughs> you can feel positive about it. If you do, I don't know what to tell you. But anyway. Oh, God. Follow up on some other podcasts. Uh, I did finally get a hold of the new DC Fontaine's album. And by Fontaine's DC, I think is the actual name. Uh, I feel like if I love the band so much, I really should know their names. And it is Fontaine's DC. God only knows how many times I uh, messed that up. Anyway, listen to the new album. It was good, but not great. I was expecting more. They gave me an above average album. I'll say it's above average, but that song I heard, I Don't Belong, and I played it for y'all on the podcast. I love that song. And there was maybe two songs like that on the album, but I wanted more. I just wanted more. But again, I like the band, and the music's pretty good. It's still one of the better albums I've heard this year. I finished The Umbrella Academy like in four days, season two. It's above average. It's an entertaining show. It's a fun show. It's a bingeable show. It's one of the few shows that I actually do, you know, binge. Binging for me is probably uh, at 10 episodes in a week. That's a binge for me. I'm not the kind of guy that can watch 10 episodes in like a day and a half or a day. Even, even three days is crazy to me. I mean, if I really am into the show and I got nothing else going on in my life, no work, no life, nothing, no, no chicks, nothing then yeah, I could probably make it through that, but no, I got shit to do, people. But yeah, it's a, it's a fun show. If you haven't watched it, I'd give it a shot. It's it's superhero, so you're like, oh, more superheroes, I'm so sick of them. And you know, I kind of am too, but I'm a sucker. Uh, I'm a sucker. I'm excited for all this Marvel and DC stuff coming out. The Boys on Prime's coming out soon. I'm a sucker for this shit. I acknowledge that it's over the top, and when people give me an argument, or they debate me, or just give me their opinion on how the superhero movie or TV show is kind of ruining movies and TV shows for all kids. Like, there's so much of it and they make so much money 
and it's such a it's such a capitalistic tie-in with all the toys and the Disney's and the fucking Sony. I mean, just huge. Like anyway, and they're just making movies at a point to sell you kids things, but now adults are buying it too. Good God, people! But I love it, and I'm a sucker. But check it out. It's a fun show. I'm not going to lie to you, people. I, I try to keep it real. Uh, I also watched the strangest movie ever made, I would argue, the Sean Connery film Zardoz, and that's Z-A-R-D-O-Z, from 1974. I mean, if you look up batshit bonkers in the dictionary, there's probably a picture of this movie. I had the night to myself, and I had the good idea of, you know what, I deserve a treat. I accomplished a lot today. I got a lot of shit done. I'm going to have a treat yourself night. Now, under normal circumstances, when Angelo has a treat yourself day or evening, pedicures are involved, wine is involved, maybe I buy some new shoes, maybe I spend a little bit of money on a dinner. I don't know. But under these quarantine times, I said, you know what? I'm just going to take two edibles and I'm going to hit this pen and I'm going to watch a crazy ass movie. So I took the edibles, I, let, I did my pen, my little vape pen with marijuana in it, and I started Zardoz. Now right off the bat, I knew it was going to be a weird movie because all I know about this movie is that infamous picture of Sean Connery, like Sean Connery 1974 Sean Connery, like James Bond Sean Connery. He's got a ponytail, he's basically naked, except he, instead of suspenders over his bare chest, it's like... It's bright red uh, ammo holster, so it's like he's got like shotgun shells and bullets and shit in there. And he's got a speedo on, and he's got like black boots. I mean, it's a crazy looking. I mean, do yourself a favor and just type in the, the just type in Zardoz images and see some crazy, crazy costumes. So right off the bat, the movie starts with a floating like stone head, and I'm like, okay, already, already, what the fuck? And then you see this this decapitated head but it's not really decapitated it's just the head and it's floating on the screen but it's like floating with the you know the effects of a 1974 low budget film so it's really just like black screen with a guy's head rolling around and he's saying oh I'm a god and my name is such and such and I cannot die I am immortal surely this is my hell and, and he's very high pitched British accent so already you're like this guy's a bitch and so he tries to explain to you this weird mythical world that this movie takes a place in where there's just slaves, cave people, just nomads. Basically, they look like, you know, every human being on the planet, but instead of, like, buildings and farms, there's just open land. So, like, they live in caves and, like, whatever. They're just wild animals. They're beasts. They're basically cavemen. And then you have Sean Connery's people, which are, like, the warriors of the, you know, of the tribe, whatever. Like, these are, like, the Navy SEALs of this land. Like, they're God's chosen soldiers. Oh, yes, there's gods. I, I'll get to that in a second. And so, Sean Connery's character, basically, his whole life is to rape and pillage. That's his whole existence. And you see a little bit of it. You see him uh, on horseback with guns. Oh, by the way, the floating head. Sean Connery's people worship the head. And the head pukes guns but from like present day guns but this is like stone age people with guns it's crazy and this this giant stone head is vomiting ammunition and vomiting weapons Sean Connery and all these people are picking it up and they have the craziest looking masks they're almost like a Chinese eyes wide shut kind of combination they're almost, yeah it's like a Chinese uh, warrior mask you know though you, you can envision it don't think samurai, you racists. I'm talking about Chinese. <laughs> I got you, you white bastards. And um, the eyes wide shut masks from that oh, amazing film. <laughs> I hope I'm not losing you people. This movie's bonkers. So then Sean Connery's people take the guns and they try to keep the Stone Age people, you know, keep them in line. But that involves a lot of rape and murder. And then you have the top tier people are like these really elite British. This movie's obviously British. I, I don't know if I've mentioned that. And the people that are above them are like gods. They're immortal. They're like the wealthy, the one percent. And it's basically a class battle with a lot of with a lot of nineteen seventy four B movie violence and 
lot of nudity. I can't even really tell you what the movie's about because I think I, it took me 20 minutes just to explain the first five minutes of the movie. And so let me, let me tell you what IMDb says about it. In the distant future, so I was already wrong. I thought it was an entirely mythical world, but no, this is Earth, people. A savage trained only to kill Sean Connery. By the way, it's hilarious seeing Sean Connery in his Scottish accent talking all these weird names. Zardoz. Trained only to kill, finds a way into the community of bored immortals. That is probably the funniest thing in the movie is yes, the immortals, the gods, are just sick and tired of being immortal and they actually want to die. It's pretty funny. He finds his way in the community of the bored immortals that alone preserve humanity's achievements. Yeah, I forgot about that part. I was pretty stoned. I, I, again, this movie is just insane do yourself a favor type in the images and then also watch the trailer and if you don't if you if you think it's not your thing you know give it give it 10 minutes if not and you're thinking you know what this movie looks hella fun watch it it's fun continuing with movies i've recently seen a movie that i should have seen years ago Heathers from 1989 that's the winona rudd and christian slater shannon doherty film i loved it it, it might be the best high school black comedy movie ever made and i can't believe it took me until 2020 to watch this movie if you haven't seen it it's about the kind of kind of the cliche high school drama it's the, the preppy kids the rich kids the stoners the jocks you know everyone's broken up on their, on their own little groups but where this one spins that notion on its head is there's one girl who's new in the cool kid click Winona Ryder's character named Veronica and she gets embarrassed at a party and she finally has had enough with the two-faced nature of high school so she hooks up with this kind of crazy sociopath played by Christian Slater is amazing and I mean both these actors are amazing in this movie and they plot to kill the popular kids and I'll leave it at that it is a comedy it's a crime movie some action but it's you know late 80s action it's only an hour and 40 minutes long it's a very dark macabre humor i cannot recommend it highly enough it, it's honestly one of the best teenage films i've ever seen it's so funny yeah check it out i love it there's some hilarious one-liners in there and i can honestly see how this movie inspired a lot of the 90s through what really today any kind of teenager, high school kind of murder movie or dark comedy, you know, owes it owes a lot to this film. Obviously, this was the first, at least that I'm aware of. Maybe this movie was inspired by another movie I'm not aware of, but I really liked it. I don't know who the actors were that played Winona Ryder's parents. They were, in my opinion, the best parents in any movie about having a teenager going through teenage angst. Maybe besides Donnie Darko, but that's not really a teenage angst movie. But maybe it is. Donnie Darko is a weird, epic movie. I, I really do like it, although I, I haven't seen it in a while. In high school, I watched it a lot with my uh, buddies. For whatever reason, we watched that movie a lot in high school. We thought we were pretty cool. But yeah, those parents in that movie are pretty cool too. I'm sure most of you have already seen the movie, but if you haven't, trust me, check it out. I would watch this before I would watch Zardoz. Now, the last movie we're going to spend a lot of time on, because this movie blew me the fuck away. It's from 2017. It's been on my Netflix watch list for, well, since 2017. The Discovery, starring Robert Redford, Jason Segel, Rooney Mara, and Jesse Plemons. Of course, you know Jesse Plemons was from Breaking Bad, Friday Night Lights, a bunch of shit. But yeah, this movie blew me away. Now, is it a good movie? Eh, hard to say. Some of the acting was atrocious. Some of the dialogue made me want to slip my wrist in a bathtub. But what really made me like this movie was the plot and how it actually unfolded, how the story progressed. Now, oh God, to summarize this movie without giving too much away, let me just kind of start. Let me just tell you what, it's, what the basis of the movie is. It takes place in the present day. Robert Redford is a scientist. And he discovers proof, indefinite proof, like there is no doubt at all, that there is such a thing as the afterlife. Now, he's, the movie starts with him giving an interview 
you know, kind of like a 60 Minutes type interview, uh, two months after the discovery is announced. So you have Robert Redford saying, hey, we discovered it, we we debated a long time whether or not to even release the information to the public, to the governments, because we didn't know what would happen, but we thought we can't keep arguably the most important decision of the human race, of human civilization, our history, to ourselves. We had to tell people that there is no doubt, there is evidence, there is proof that there is an afterlife. It's as real as you and me talking right now. And then the interviewer, uh, Mary Steenburgen in a small role, who is married to Ted Danson, the man, and she asks him, does Robert Redford take any blame? Does he blame himself for what's happening in the world? Because once this was announced that there is an afterlife, people start committing suicide at an alarmingly high rate. And he's like, no, 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 I, I don't blame myself. I just discovered it. I don't use the terms heaven, hell, religion, faith. You know, he was, he's a, he's a scientist. He doesn't really use those kind of buzzwords as he's called them. He, he, he loathes the word faith. All he is is a scientist. He's very passionate about that. And then, of course, the camera guy blows his head up, blows his brains out right in the middle of the interview live, and then starts to be called moving on. So people are just killing themselves younger and younger. There's a whole thing in the movie about teenagers killing themselves, children with, like, there's a scene where they're talking about this kid that's got, like, leukemia, and the kid's, like, five, and the kid's happy that he's dying. He's like, oh, I get to go to another plane of it. I get to move on. I don't have leukemia thing is they don't know what's on the other side they just know it exists they have no they don't have no visual audio representation of what it is they just know it exists which just blows me away it's such a cool idea i can't believe this uh, movie at least to my knowledge has never been made like this and so it got me thinking if the afterlife was indeed discovered and proven to exist and to be real and people are just doing these suicides in mass numbers i mean the the first scene takes place two months after the discovery and then the movie proceeds with Robert Redford's family two years later and the number of suicides in just America I believe was over four million so in two years four million Americans killed themselves I don't know if, I don't know the worldwide numbers because this is a fictional movie but it just got me thinking what if this happened in real life so I think a good starting point in this conversation is do I agree with the premise of the movie is there an afterlife and do you think it could be scientifically proven? Well, if you're asking me, do I believe in the afterlife? My answer would be, I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't pretend to know. Is heaven real? Fuck if I know. I'd like to think reincarnation is real, but who the fuck knows? I really don't know. And that's where I have to start. If I die, which <laughs> it's not a question of if, but when, when I die, and I, you know, wake up at the pearly gates, I'd be like, son of a bitch, I was wrong. Oh, well. Cause I, I tend to say I don't believe in the afterlife, but I'm not comfortable saying no. I'm more comfortable in saying I don't know, which I think I talked about it on a podcast or two ago. We need to be more comfortable saying we don't know things. It's okay not to know. You don't have to pretend to have an opinion. You don't need to regurgitate some trash you heard some other piece of shit say, you know? If you honestly do not know, if you don't, if you're not comfortable voicing your opinion because you don't know all the facts and you don't know the whole story, you don't even know what you really think, it's okay to say, I don't know. So, is the afterlife real? I don't know. But, using the premise of the movie, if I woke up tomorrow and it would say, afterlife is real, we have proof, and here it is, and it was laid out in a way that any honky could figure it out is true. So what I'm trying to say is, if I woke up tomorrow and I saw the headline, Afterlife Discovered, we have proof, and it can be explained in a way that's understandable to most people, I do think there would be suicides. Do I think four, over four million suicides in two years? Yeah. And if there was more, I wouldn't be that shocked. Let's say you wake up after life is real. What is the first thing you do? Maybe you would cry. Maybe you'd be angry. Maybe you would have doubt. I think I think most people would have doubt. They wouldn't believe it. I feel like once the evidence has been shown and once certain 
people in the media. It doesn't have to be journalists or politicians or athletes or actors, but it has to be well-respected people. So, like, oh, God, that's, it's hard to say who's well-respected by the majority of the people without politicizing things. You know, it'd be easy if Santa Claus came out and said that he believed in it, but, you know, whatever. And by the way, did you guys know that there's a push to make Santa Claus gay? I don't know why. I'm not against it. I didn't think it came out of left field, but isn't 2020 the year of shit coming out of left field? Anyway, because you know if, like, Bill Gates or Joe Rogan or Elon Musk or Oprah Winfrey, The Rock, Kevin Hart, or uh, John Legend's wife, what's her name? I don't know why she's even popular, but anyway. Just think of anyone who's got, like, a lot of followers on social media. It's sad that that's how we gauge people now. Because I feel like if enough scientists say it's real, people really wouldn't care. You'd have to have, like, a Taylor Swift or somebody come out and say, no, this shit is real. And that way over time, and I think a relatively short time, people would understand, okay, all right, this is weird, this is scary, this is something that will revolutionize all mankind. It'll revolutionize how we live. People's faith, people's ideologies, their convictions, shit, everything would be different. So that's why I can see a lot of people committing suicide. I wouldn't because I'm under the impression I am in the belief that if there is an afterlife that's real, why would I just abandon this current life I have and just embrace the unknowingness of the afterlife because that's the whole thing in the movie people they knew they know it exists 100 percent real but there's no video there's no audio there's nothing the afterlife could just be you frozen in time or you just walking a, a, a complete black void you, we just don't know so that's why i couldn't commit suicide and i would hope many people wouldn't uh that are in my life now, if more information would come out down the line, and then you could actually see what the afterlife looked like, and you could understand more. I still, I can't see myself killing myself in any certain, any, any way, or in, believing that it's okay in any way. Not okay on the moral issue, but just like, you know, I got shit I want to do here. We don't know what it's like there. I like nature. I like animals. I like my friends and family. I like video games. I, I like uh, doing this. I like doing a lot of shit that may not be in the afterlife. So why would I just take that gamble, take that risk? No, it's one thing if there's like a nuclear bomb goes off and everyone's like, well, fuck it. Then that's one thing. But just to get up and say, you know what? I'm done with this life. Uh, I'm going to see what I'm going to, I'm going to go beyond. I forgot what it's called in the movie. It, moving on is called something. Maybe it's called moving on. Ah, fuck if I know. I think if millions and millions and millions of people are killing themselves, just think what that would do to the economy, the government, just society as a whole. I could foresee us being in this weird mixture combination of like 1950s, but with technology of today. Because so many people would, just, would be gone that you wouldn't have... I mean, if you think driving during coronavirus is A-OK, -okay, imagine 4 million people just up and pieced out. I mean, no traffic. Unemployment would fall. <laughs> but you know that's, that's what politicians would care about, the geopolitical repercussions of all this. But I could foresee people just saying, I don't give a fuck. Riots, protests. I hope there wouldn't be mass shootings. I hope... But see, again, I, I, I could believe that. If the afterlife is real, I could see some jabroni, probably some white incel honky bitch, saying, you know what, I'm going to go shoot a bunch of minorities because they need to move on and use that as an excuse. You know, mo most mass shooters tend to be white men. I don't know what it is. You never see Asians or blacks or Hispanics doing it, or you do, it's very rare. But anyway, that's a whole other topic. And I think I would actually go into politics in this uh, hypothetical world because I feel like I could get my, a good message. I'd be like, don't kill yourselves. If you want to kill yourself, we're not going to make it illegal. But just do it yourself. Don't try to do it in a way that takes others with you against their will. Don't try to make a scene. You know, there was parts in the movie where they were talking about spectacle deaths. How mostly young people were thinking, like, this is a kind of a hip trend to do. So, like, they were dying on the 50-yard line in a, in a high school football field in a way. Or... They all were jumping on the tracks of a subway. I mean, it was a spectacle killing, which is scary. Yeah, that made me very sad in parts in the movie. 
However, do I think this could really happen? Absolutely. I mean, motherfuckers be eating Tide Pods, people. So, of course, there's going to be some spectacle deaths. But I would get into politics. My message would be, okay, we know this is real now, but let's not give up on the Earth. You know what I'm saying? I would be a pretty environmentally sound president, assuming I win. <laughs> let's just assume I become president in this hypothetical world where the afterlife is real and, and motherfuckers be killing themselves. I would say, I'm pro-life, don't kill yourself, because you still have a positive impact on people around you. I think people would be more willing to let bygones be bygones at a certain point. I think that society would really stop being in each other's throats the whole time. Suddenly, if you have a difference of opinion, you're not going to be yelling and screaming at each other because suddenly things will be put in perspective. I think people would realize how insignificant all of this really is, and their perception of what's important would shift to more positive elements like love and empathy, kindness, forgiveness. There would be a lot more fucking, which I'm all for, because there's not really, you know, who cares? I would, I would really strive to take care of the environment. I would really put an emphasis on making the earth green as we can be. I would, I mean, global warming wouldn't be halted, but it would be not as dire as it is now because of all the suicides. And by the way, it wasn't just random people killing themselves in this movie. They were talking about athletes, you know, actors. This is something that was affecting everybody. The 1% were killing themselves because, well, I only have $300 billion. Well, in the afterlife, maybe I'll have $400 billion. ka you know. So, I would be president, focusing on the environment, focusing on bringing people together, focusing on let's just make the earth the best earth it can be. I would put scientists in position to really help further this uh, country. I want progress. I, I, just, I just have to have a, a high opinion of people in this hypothetical world. They would just see for the world for what it is. It's temporal, but it's all we know for sure. Because, yes, the afterlife is real, but we don't really know. So, yeah, what else would I do? I, I, I think the arts and, the, and sports are still important. I would still put an emphasis on, like, all right, people, you got to go out and do some sports, see some movies, get the economy rolling. I think small businesses would real. You know what? I would be the president who would really push small businesses because uh, what the fuck else? You know what I'm saying? If everyone's killing themselves... And there's this stuff on the shelves that are just l being left out of rot. You kind of have to redo all of society in terms of how does food come from farm to market. I mean, you would have to put an emphasis on farmers. I mean, farmers are already important, and they get spit on by both political parties. I don't give a fuck if you're Republican or Democrat. Farmers get fucked over. But I feel like in this hypothetical world, farming would be so important. And I think that's why you would have almost a, a Mayberry, you know, Annie Griffith type society where it's much more community. You would still have the internet and social media and everything, but I don't know. I just foresee people staying closer to home, if that makes any sense. You would still travel, of course. So that's not what I mean. I'm, maybe I'm not explaining myself in the right way. Maybe I'm not explaining myself thoroughly here. I just feel like it would shift people's minds to not hoarding wealth, not hoarding goods, not hoarding possessions. Suddenly, capitalism doesn't look so nice because who gives a fuck? There's another being of existence. If I'm broke here, maybe I'm a millionaire there. I, I think the people that would choose to stay here would be like, it's money? Who, yeah, who cares? So... I would almost try to make it, I would still be a capitalistic society, but I also would bring in some more socialism and libertarian ideas, and I would balance it with maybe some conservatism. I don't know really where I'm a conservative on, but I'm sure I am somewhere. I just don't know. <laughs> We'd have to go uh, uh, item by item, if you will. So that's what I would do in this hypothetical world where the afterlife is real. I'd run for president. Hopefully I'd win. And I would remake the world in a way that I see fit. Focusing on each other, focusing on supporting the small businesses and, lo and the local communities, taking care of the environment, 
and I think the rest of the shit would just fall away. You would have such a, a smaller... You wouldn't have such a drastic smaller population, but you would have a smaller population. So I think you could really get some forward-thinking agendas across. I think you could pass Medicare for All. You could pass a UBI. You could pass a living wage. You could make it a human right to have housing, to have a job. I think that would have to happen in this society. But I think you get a lot of that shit across. I, we just, I feel like we would just come out the people who don't kill themselves and who are on antidepressants, because I feel like a lot of people would be depressed. There'd be a lot of people that want to kill themselves, but they just can't. And uh, you would have to have a lot more freedom in, ter in, ter in terms of speech. Because I know we say we have freedom of speech here, but it uh, depends. Anyway, I'm, I'm spouting nonsense here. So check out The Discovery. On a scale of 1 to 10, I say the movie as a whole is probably a 6. But the actual plot, 10 out of 10, baby. 10 out of 10. I really would like them to be a TV show, with like an hour-long, 10-episode series where you could really delve into this hypothetical thing. But I'm not going to spoil the rest of the movie. Um, I just want to tell you what I was thinking about. No, I was stoned when I was watching it, duh. So maybe that's why I was having all these thoughts, but... I also was thinking... <laughs> we spent all this fucking podcast talking about this whack-ass movie. I was also thinking that there'd be... I, I would hope there wouldn't be a rush to buy guns, civil war, in terms of states' rights and everything, because it would just be mass pandemonium in certain places, I feel. Uh, I feel like, as president, I could sit down with these people, like, I know you think nothing matters, or that religion has shifted into extremism. I don't know. Don't kill anyone that doesn't want to die. If you're angry, if you don't believe in it, if you think it's heresy, just kill yourself. Or kill others of like-mindedness. Don't kill strangers or kill people at a grocery store or at a school. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's the kind of present I would be. I would try to sit down with these bastards. I would say, hey, you know what? You want Texas? You can have Texas. I would make Texas the I don't believe in science state. And then you could just throw everybody in there. And I would even say, you know what? And I will even pay for a wall. You want a wall around Texas to keep you in? I will pay for it. Oh, anyway. <laughs> Oh boy, now I'm just talking shit here. If you're still listening to this, you're 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 braver than most. Not saner than most, but maybe not even brave. You know what? You fucked up. If you're listening to this still and you're enjoying it, uh, I love you. But uh, oh wow, we really should bring this mofo to a close here. I've been rambling for a while about just three movies. <laughs> well, let's open up my diary see what we got. But first, let's take one more hit for those that are still with us. Godzilla. Oh. All right. Let's see what's on the old diary here. <clears throat> violence begets violence. When these protests turn violent, the state will then turn violent. And it's just a never-ending cycle of violence where more and more people get hurt or killed and the message gets diluted more and more. Now that the border agents are leaving Seattle and Portland, some of the violent protests need to stop. Okay. I know what, what happened. I was writing that. Uh, I still do believe in that. I still do think violence begets violence, but what I didn't say that is I believe that it's warranted sometimes. Now, this all came to be because I was talking to some friends about the term anarchists. I was telling them that I'm all for the protests. I'm all for the movement. I think they're important. I, you know, I, I, I sound like a broken record. I feel like I talk about the fucking protests every, every podcast. But the point is, I said what I... I'm not supporting are these anarchists who are just blowing up cars, breaking windows, starting fires, who don't really have any ideology but to fuck shit up. And the, some of my friends were saying, well, that, that term anarchist is being corrupted or is being taken over by the Trump administration, the far right, blah, 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 which I, I don't know if any of that's true. I do know that the, the president does like to use the term anarchist right along Antifa. Which Antifa not even a fucking thing. It's just a belief. There is no there is no Antifa group or system or leader. It's just a belief. And aren't shouldn't all Americans be anti-fascist Antifa? Now, if you think if you're Antifa, that means you believe in anarchy, you're dead wrong. That's not what they believe in. They literally believe in, you know what? Fascism is wrong, and I'm going to fight anyone who supports it. 
So like those white nationalists believe in it. So if you see a white nationalist or a Nazi or a proud boy or a boogaloo boy or whoever the fuck it is, just give them a few knocks in the mouth a few times. You know what I'm saying? Remind them where they are. We fought two wars about this, you know? Anyway, let me rewind it. I was getting ahead of myself. I was reading an article in the Seattle Times maybe a week or so ago about how many businesses are leaving Capitol Hill and the surrounding area because of the damage being done during these protests. Now, the term damage is very complicated because I think everyone has maybe a different definition of what damage is. So to me, damage is breaking a window, you know, fucking up a car, breaking a sidewalk up to get little bits of cinder block to, or little bits of cement or asphalt to throw at people, burning uh, trash cans, dumpsters. Well, that's a little bit less of one because that's just garbage. Who gives a fuck? But I also understand how the, you know, the court, then the courthouse, the uh, 13th precinct down there got all fucked up. But see that, I kind of, I, I kind of understand why. Do I agree with it? Kind of. Do I wish it didn't happen? Yes. But do I understand why it happened and the importance of it happening? Yes. So it's, I'm a little 50-50 on that. Although I tend, you know what, I take it back. I'm 60-40 for. But I'm not for any kind of destruction of of uh, public property that taxes pay for because that's effectively what we pay for but i also don't mind using my tax dollars for a movement like this because you know you can almost look at it like that so anyway this thing is snowballing out of control the whole thing is the term anarchists so what i who i don't approve of are people at these protests who don't support black lives matter who don't support any kind of ideology besides anarchy they're like the joker they just want to see shit burn they're not doing it to stand up to police brutality or to stand up against the coronavirus response or to the just disgustingly ripe income inequality that's in this country there's so many things that if they just said hey i'm blowing up this building because this building gets money from, I don't know, child pedophiles. I don't know what to tell you, but it's something. And then I could say, all right, blow that fucking building up. But, you know, if you're just blowing cars up and scratching them up and breaking windows of a small business, I mean, who... come on, man. Put your head under a car tire and let them run over you. We don't need this. You're hurting it. Because then you get people, like some people in my family, they watch the news too much, but and they're fucking boomers. And I'm not, I don't say that as a negative tone because I don't like how there is this kind of ageism. I fall into it a lot. I, I sometimes say all boomers do this, all millennials do this. I'm trying to work on that unless I'm making a joke. Therefore, you know, anything goes. My point being, there's now a lot of people that vote that are in their 50s and 60s and older that now look at Black Lives Matter and they see anarchy. And that's not what it means. That's not what it's for. So, I don't think I was out of line by saying I don't like the people who are destroying shit. Now, you're not really going to know why someone's doing this unless you talk to them. If you just see the news and you see mostly white people doing this, then you're going to make these assumptions like I have. Now, if I sat down with some of these quote-unquote anarchists and say, hey, so you were the person that did such and such. Why did you do that? Well, man, it's because of me. I'm like, okay, I know why. What about you? Because, man, down with it all. Fuck the government. Okay. I, all right. You're all scum. <laughs> you know? I support the protest in many different ways. I also support the many ways that people are protesting, but I will not support people that are just doing brazen damage just to do it. And although I also understand and even empathize with the uh, uh, argument that, well, you don't really know how someone's going to show their anger or displeasure, and you can't really judge how people deal with racism and police brutality and blah, 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 blah. And I could not agree more. Just because I wouldn't do something doesn't mean it's not okay for someone else to do it. However, I think you can do it without uh, destroying a small business. And on that happy note, I'm going to end it here. I love you. I hope you all are doing your best to survive right now. I know the coronavirus just keeps fucking going and it doesn't look like there was any end in sight. The fucking deadline for the unemployment benefits went down and no, Congress didn't do shit. 
Congress also ain't going to do shit for the rent. So, I mean, the government's not supporting you. The only people that can support you are yourself and your loved ones in your community. So, on that happy note, I love you. You guys take it easy, and I'll uh, talk to you later.